everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And then the writer goes on and says in Isaiah 53, in verse 12, he poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors. He bore the sin of many, and he made intercession for the transgressors. Jesus took our sins. What happened to my sin? Why am I not now suffering right now the consequences of my sin? The enslavement, the oppression, the guilt. Because Jesus bore my sins. And when I look at the cross, I look at my sins being taken away. And I can rejoice and enjoy this beautiful life because of what Jesus did there. The Bible says that in dying on the cross, Jesus made atonement for our sins. First John 4, 10, and this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. A propitiation is a, an atoning sacrifice it is a sacrifice made to appease God, to pay a price. And all of that was done when Jesus bore my sins. And so he made atonement for them. And as a result of that, my sins were forgiven in his name. By the power of the cross and by the authority of the cross, sin is forgiven. First John 2 and verse 12, I write to you little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. The idea of doing something for somebody's name with his permission, with his authority to honor and glorify him, all of that is true. That's why my sins are forgiven because of the great thing that Jesus did, because his name is great, because his power is great, because his authority is over all, because of all of those things, my sins are forgiven for his name's sake. It's what John writes in 1 John chapter 2. 2 and verse 12. And a similar thing Paul says in Ephesians 1 and verse 7, that we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our sins. It's what he did again at the cross that gave the power, the power of that blood, the power of the name of Jesus, according to the riches of his grace. And so sins were forgiven. My sins were Washed away is another way the Bible describes it. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 5. From Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, the ruler over the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and washed us from our own sins, from our sins in his own blood. And, and you can almost visualize that. The blood of Christ flowing down from the cross guilty and dirty, vile sinners come in contact with it. And it cleanses us. It washes us. Red blood washing souls white. That's the picture of what Jesus did for us. They were washed away. They were purged is another way of saying it. In Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3, talking about the person of Jesus Christ and who he really is and was being the brightness of his glory, the express image of his person. Jesus is the glory of God, the brightness of the glory of God, the express image of the person of God. He upholds all things by the word, all things by the word of his power. It says when he had himself purged our sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. The word purged there is defined in its original language or in the Greek language by Joseph Henry Thayer as a cleansing, a purification, a ritual washing. So our sins are washed, they're purged, they're cleansed in the blood of Jesus Christ. We see these commercials on television that try to sell us soap. A lot of money is spent trying to sell us soap, have you noticed that? And you have this stuff, you know, OxyClean or whatever it is, and and they give you the demonstration. They put this dirty garment in water containing the product, whatever it is. And it's so filthy when it goes in there and they wash it, you know, and it comes out bright and clean. And I think they may Photoshop that a little bit. I'm not sure. But it looks so good, you know, when it comes out. Well, we're not Photoshop, but we're clean. 
white in the blood of the Lamb. We're washed, we're purged. And those sins that were washed away are then amazingly forgotten by God. God who knows everything chooses to forget something. He chooses to forget our sins that were born by Jesus and forgiven in his name and washed away in his blood. I invite you to turn in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 10. Notice a few verses with me here. We'll start in the beginning of the chapter in verse 1, actually. The law having a shadow of the good things to come and not the very image of the things can never with these same sacrifices which they offer continually year by year make those who approach perfect. The old law, the Old Testament law of Moses could never make a person right, could never cleanse them of the guiltiness of their sins and the consciousness of their sins. They were still living with sin. And the reason was that the blood of bulls and goats couldn't take away sin, but rather in offering the blood of bulls and goats and lambs every year, they were reminded not that they were forgiven, but that they needed forgiveness, that their sins were still on them, that they were still dealing with it. And so the writer goes on to explain that. He says, those sacrifices would would not have ceased to have been offered for the worshipers once purified would have no more consciousness of sin. If those sacrifices had worked, you wouldn't have to keep offering them. But in these sacrifices, there is a reminder of sin, or in those sacrifices, rather, there is a reminder of sins every year. It's not possible, but that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sin. And then in verses 17 and 18, after talking about the sacrifice of Christ, Christ coming and offering himself as a sacrifice, he says, Their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Where there is remission of these, there's no longer an offering for sin. Jesus came, he offered himself once, once for all. And God promises, based on the blood of his son, the blood of the covenant, that he will not remember those sins. That's part of what the new covenant says. If you go back in the book of Hebrews to Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 12, that's what God says. Starting way back in Jeremiah 31, quoted in Hebrews chapter 8, I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their lawless deeds. I will remember no more. God chooses to forget. Now here, an important juncture in this lesson, uh, all of the things that I've said so far, I think, are very easy for Christians to agree with and understand. But here's where a problem comes for us. Because the reality is that when I started talking a few minutes ago about being liberated from sin, about being freed from the guilt of sin and the consciousness of sin, there are some people sitting in this auditorium who are Christians who are thinking, I don't know what you're talking about. because I'm still guilty of my sins. That's what, that's what some Christians think. I'm here to tell you this morning that Jesus didn't bear your sins on Calvary, forgive your sins in his name, wash them in his blood. And God didn't forget your sins so that you could still remember them. We need to be aware that we sinned, for sure. But to carry that guilt around after God has forgiven, after God has done all of these things for us, those sins are forgotten by God and they need to be forgotten by us. In Hebrews 9 and verse 14, the writer it just couldn't be any more clear. 
as you go through the book of Hebrews, that, that sin is forgiven in the sacrifice of Christ and his blood, they're washed away. He purged our sins, as the writer said. In Hebrews 9 and verse, verse 14, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Cleanse your conscience. What's that conscience? What is your conscience? It's that, you know, somebody says that voice deep down inside where the acoustics are bad. You know, <laughs> you have trouble listening to it. But most of us who are Christians have pretty good consciences. We have that thing down inside us that tells us, oh, you're doing wrong here. This is wrong what you're doing. And we feel guilt because of that. But what Paul says is the blood of Jesus cleanses your conscience, meaning no more feeling of guilt. Because there is no more guilt. And because you're free from the guilt of sin, you're free also to serve God. You don't have to worry about, oh, I'm not good enough to do what God wants me to do. I'm just this poor, lowly piece of trash. No, you're not. God's made you something else. On in chapter 10 and verse 22, as the writer really weaves this thread, this theme through the book of Hebrews, he says in chapter 10 and verse 22, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith. We can come to God fully assured. Full, in full assurance of faith, he talks about coming boldly before the throne of God. But come in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. The idea of sprinkling the blood as they did in the Old Testament, the blood of the sacrifices on, on the people, on the book, on, on, on the things of the tabernacle. And now Christ's blood is on us. Dr. Carl Menninger was a world-renowned psychiatrist. He once said that if he could convince patients in psychiatric hospitals that their sins were forgiven, 75% of them could walk out the next day. Because the problem, so much of the problem that people have is, is not really, it's not really the problems that they think they have. You know, we want to blame people for our problems. We, this caused me to be this way or this or whatever it is. And really, the vast majority, and here's a psychiatrist that recognizes that. We, we bring the sin into our lives of our own accord. We choose to disobey God. We try to rationalize it. We try to get around it. We try to deal with guilt in all sorts of unhealthy ways. And the, the whole answer to it is just the blood of Jesus Christ. If we just, in faith, take what Jesus has done for us, Admit that we've done wrong. Admit that our thoughts have been wrong. Our actions have been wrong. Our whole way of dealing with all of it's been wrong. And just submit to Jesus and bring it all to the cross. Problem solved. And as Menninger said, 75% of folks could walk out of the psychiatric, psychiatric hospitals the next day. if They just accept forgiveness. Now, this brings us, I think, to uh, a kind of interesting question. What role does baptism play in this? I haven't even mentioned baptism yet. But I want to spend these last few moments, few minutes in our study this morning, thinking about, well, if all that you've said is true, where does baptism even come into the picture? And how does it relate to the forgiveness of my sins? Well, a lot of the things that we said about and that we read in Scripture about what Jesus did for us in forgiving us our sins, those same things are said about baptism. Uh, for instance, baptism washes away sin. Now, we said the blood of Jesus washes away sin. Well, how can the blood of Jesus wash away sins and baptism wash away sins? But that's what Saul of Tarsus was told, to arise and be baptized and wash away your sins calling on the name of the Lord. Nobody hearing that command could think that baptism doesn't have something to do with the washing away of sins. In Colossians chapter 2 and verse 11, listen to this. Have you ever made this connection? Colossians chapter 2 and verse 11. In him we were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ buried with him in baptism. When, when, when did we put the body of sins off? When did we get rid of those sins? Paul says, when you were buried with him in baptism. That's when. That's how. 
And so baptism has a lot to do with what happened to my sins. Because it's in baptism that I come in contact with what Jesus did for me. Jesus died on the cross for me and I'm, I'm buried as he was buried, as he died and was buried. I'm buried in baptism. And as he rose to walk in newness of life, I rise to walk in newness of life as Paul expresses in Romans chapter 6 verses 3 and 4. So here is the place where I, where I come in contact with all of that. The washing away of my sins, the bearing of my sins on Calvary, all of that is expressed in baptism. Baptism washes away my sins, but it has to be done for the remission of sins. In Acts 2 and verse 38, this is plain as plain. Peter said to the Jews on that occasion, after they realized they crucified the Christ, he says, repent, let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. So baptism is for the remission of sins. Now, here's a point I think that's real important for all of us to get. I think a, a lot of folks may not realize what I'm about to say. The vast majority of baptisms that are practiced and uh, done in the religious world today, the vast majority of baptisms are not done for the remission of sins in the way that Peter's talking about here. And you say, well, what do you mean by that? Everybody, everybody in the religious world will tell you they're baptizing for the remission of sins. Nobody who even claims to be any sort of a, you know, kind of Christian, whatever, you know, <laughs> model of Christian you claim to be, as if there were different ones, but nobody out there in the religious world is going to say, no, no, Peter, Peter's wrong. You don't baptize for the remission of sins. See, everybody out there claims to be baptizing for the remission of sins. At least most all of them do. But they define what that means differently than what Peter's talking about. You say, well, how do they define it? You can just research it if you'd like. I've had dozens of discussions with denominational people over the years. And here's the way they look at this. They say that the phrase for the remission of sins is actually meaning because your sins are already forgiven because of the remission of sins. That's how they read that. Now, I don't know how many different denominational folks I've had that will make that argument. They'll tell you, oh yeah, I was baptized for the remission of sins. And you say, well, what do you mean by that? Well, it's because, of, because my sins were already forgiven. That's not what Peter's meaning. But let me read you from a, a, a website. I, I just went to an evangelical website this last week and got this quote. Um, they say the definition of the word for and for the remission of sins, the definition of the word for in this context is either because of or in regard to and not in order to get. Therefore, Acts 2.38, when interpreted correctly, does not teach that baptism is required for salvation. So they tell you, you're baptized for the remission of sins, but yeah, it's not required for salvation. It's because you've already got remission of sins. That's their argument. That's what they mean when they say we're baptizing for the remission of sins. So when somebody comes from a denomination and they say to me, well, I was baptized for the remission of your sins, of sins, I just want them to know what your denomination means when they say that is different from what Peter meant. Because what Peter meant by for the remission of sins is what Jesus meant when in Matthew chapter 26 and verse 28, he says, this is the blood of the new covenant, which is given, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Same exact phrase. Was Jesus' blood shed because sins were already forgiven? No, it was shed because sins were to be forgiven by it. Jesus' blood was shed for the remission of sins. Peter said, be baptized for the remission of sins. Those phrases have to mean the same thing. Jesus' blood was shed for the remission of sins to get us remission of sins. We are baptized in response to Jesus' blood to get us remission of sins. And unless we understand for the remission of sins like that, we don't understand it. And that's the vast majority of the religious world today. 
that does not understand what for the remission of sins means. You have to apply the blood of Christ to your life. That's all there is to it. And that's done initially by being baptized. When I was in college uh, down in Florida, and several of you have gone down to Florida College, and maybe some of you also uh, were not wealthy, so you had to take on work study, they call it. That's a fancy name for, we'll pay you a little bit of money or take a little bit off of your tuition if you'll clean the bathrooms. So, uh, so I was cleaning the bathrooms in this men's dorm down in Florida, uh, which Florida has, let's just say it has some problems with mildew, okay? It has some problems with mildew. And the showers in, in the men's dormitory, most of the time you couldn't tell if the tile was supposed to be pink or green or whatever because all the mildew was all over it. So it's my job to get all that clean. So a typical Saturday night, because I didn't, you know, date anybody or anything like that, my typical Saturday night was spent uh, cleaning the showers in the men's dormitory. Well, I was in there one night just scrubbing away, you know, just regular soap and water kind of, just had this brush, was trying to get all that mildew off, wasn't getting anywhere. That stuff is really hard to get off, just scrubbing away. And uh, the, the, one of the dorm parents comes in, and he's kind of just checking out the dorm, and he, he looks in, and he says, uh, what you doing in there, Steve? I said, I'm, I'm cleaning the shower. He said, on Saturday night? I said, yes, sir. He said, well, is it coming off? I, I said, no, sir, it's not. He said, I think I've got something for you. In a little while, he came back with this bottle, squirt bottle. And I'm not sure of the brand name. I think it was X14. I didn't know what it was. He said, spray this on there and just watch. I sprayed it on the mildew. I watched. If you've ever used the stuff, you know what it does. The mildew just disappeared <laughs> right before my eyes. I mean, for a minute, I thought we were still living in the age of miracles. I was like, <laughs> how can you get this crud off just by squirting a little stuff on it. I didn't do the work. I didn't do the scrubbing. It was all in the power of what I applied. And it's gone. And you looked at the shower and you couldn't even tell that it used to have mildew in it. And that's Jesus' blood on you. He's done all of the work, all the powers in his blood. All you have to do is apply it. All you have to do is apply it. And it starts by being baptized for the remission of your sins. Not because they're forgiven already, but in order so that they may be forgiven. You say, well, I'm a Christian. I don't live perfectly still. I try to do better. I've turned away, but still I sin. I do too. But I don't let the guilt of those sins weigh me down. I feel the guilt of them. I take them to Jesus. His blood still works. Sometimes after I got those showers cleaned up, you know, the mildew might come back. But it just took a little squirt of that X14, and man, it was gone. Peter told Simon... Acts 8, verse 22, who was a Christian and fallen into sin, repent of this, your wickedness, and pray God if perhaps the thought of your heart will be forgiven you. John tells us in 1 John chapter 1, and verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. At the beginning this morning, I talked about how God can do something with your tragedy. God can do something with your sins too. He can save you from them. He can forget them and help you forget them. He can wash them away. It's all on the cross. It's all in the blood of Jesus. And if you'd respond to that this morning, 
If you're not a Christian, be baptized today and wash away your sins coming in contact with that blood. If you are a Christian, you've sinned. If you confess your sins, he's faithful to forgive and to cleanse you of all unrighteousness. We'd ask you to come while we stand and while we sing.